Greetings from CNS and welcome to this new episode of CNS Dialogues for Sustainable Development. This is a special CNS so, uh, series presenting insightful and thought-provoking interviews from leaders for accelerating progress towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Ending AIDS by 2030 is one of these targets and we have just 133 months left to do so. Also, we cannot end AIDS without ending tuberculosis because TB still remains one of the single largest killers of people living with HIV. This episode of CNS Dialogues for Sustainable Development uh, features today Dr. Susan Swindles, Professor in the Department of Internal Medicine, University of Nebraska Medical Center, USA. And we will hear more of us, uh, more of this from her today, on site from the 12th National Conference of AIDS Society of India, which began today in Chennai. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. And uh, we are really excited because I think you have done a lot of work on TB control in people living with HIV and we are excited to hear about new treatment options for uh, preventing TB in people living with HIV. So uh, do you think we are losing on the fight against AIDS because of tuberculosis? Because despite lot of efforts being made by people like you and other HIV experts, uh, people living with HIV are now leading a normal life and lifespan has also increased but still lot many are dying because of tuberculosis. So uh, how to prevent that and what are your reflections on this? So thank you for that and you're absolutely right that TB is the number one killer of people with HIV globally and so uh, it's a very it's a disease that can be prevented and it's also very treatable so really there is not much excuse for this and I think we can do much better and so we know that TB preventive therapy is effective it's effective in people with HIV but the uptake globally is very poor so very few people with HIV get offered this and the reasons for that are several. So first of all, the conventional preventive therapy for TB takes a long time. It's at least six or nine months of treatment. The treatment has side effects. TB drugs have not developed as quickly as drugs for HIV. Now we have HIV drugs which are very potent. They work extremely well and have basically no side effects, which is fantastic. But for TB, we're still dealing with drugs with side effects. Physicians, providers worry that if they give preventive therapy, perhaps they will give patients that have TB but they don't know it resistance. And um, for people with HIV, there's been so much priority on giving them antiretroviral therapy that the TB preventive therapy just gets forgotten. So I think we have some exciting opportunities now. We have new, shorter courses of treatment to prevent TB that are as good, if not better, than the standard six months of Iron Age. So four months of rifampin works well. Uh, weekly INH and rifampin for three months works very well. And a study that I just co-chaired that was recently published shows that one month of daily INH and rifapentin works well. And so the beauty of the one month treatment is that the completion rates, the number of people that completed the treatment was the highest we've ever seen because taking treatment for a month, most people can do that. Whereas, you know, six months is a whole other story and then you get tired of it. But one month, people did very well. And because it was so short, there was less side effects and it was as effective. And so we're excited that the WHO is looking at including this in their guidelines and we hope that there will be uptake of this one month treatment in uh, many countries in the world including you know here in India. Uh, so uh, this study was done in the US or uh, which other countries? So this study was funded by the US National mm -hmm. Institutes of Health. They paid for it. Mm -hmm. 
but it was done in uh, many different countries throughout the world uh, that are part of this NIH-funded clinical trials network. So we had two sites in India, site in Thailand, Haiti, Peru, Brazil, and then many sub-Saharan African countries, South Africa, Botswana, Uganda, Kenya, all contributed. And then we had 3,000 patients in the study all together, all with people with HIV and that didn't have TB, and we gave them this therapy and found it was as good as the control, which was the standard six months. So uh, probably it means this is good news because, uh, as you said, uh, treatment adherence would be much more for uh, a one-month therapy, obviously. Uh, what about uh, any way to prevent latent TB in people living with HIV because every new case of TB will come, active TB will come from latent TB. Yes, that's yes. absolutely right. So um, I would just like to add one comment though about the one month treatment. Um, rifapentin, which is a more potent drug than rifampin or rifampicin, unfortunately is not yet available everywhere. I believe the approval in India is pending as we speak it is approved in a few countries, but right now it's a lot more expensive than the standard. And um, people have to take actually more pills. So we, we have work to do in improving access, both in getting the manufacturer to reduce the cost, and, or ideally um, getting the, you know, your wonderful generic drug manufacturers here in India to make a combination tablet that will be easier to take. So those things, I think, are important before uh, global uptake. But I know that there's interest in that. So in terms of preventing even TB infection, that's a little bit more um, complicated. And so traditionally, tuberculosis is a disease of mostly poor people that live in um, crowded housing situations or that are forced together maybe in a, a prison or some area like that where there's just not a lot of space, they have um, maybe poor air quality, uh, inadequate sanitation, not enough access to healthcare. All of these things can contribute to the spread of TB by just airborne spread, as you know, is spread by uh, coughing, by droplets. And so uh, that is more of a sort of infrastructure, public health problem than one that can be cured by medicine. But that's not to say that we shouldn't all be trying to do that. And as you know, people with HIV are uh, at more risk for, develop, for ca catching this TB infection. And then if they do, they have a much greater risk of going on to develop active disease. And so those are important priorities. Uh, what uh, you're, say, you're right that the shorter regimen will take some time for its uptake. But what about uh, the proper use of current tools available? Whatever is the current regimen available, uh, I think we have a target of uh, putting 6 million people with HIV on TB preventive therapy by 2022. Uh, as of now, the uptake is low there. For, forget about those who are not infected with HIV, they're right. also there also. So now, how do we go, how do we accelerate this use or better use of existing tools? And uh, do you think uh, it is important to test and treat latent TB rather than just treat in the case of people living with HIV? Should they not be tested for latent TB first? I think the data would suggest that, well, we, no, we know this. I know that if someone has HIV, then they will benefit from the preventive therapy whether or not they have evidence of latent infection. So you do a TB skin test or you do this interferon gamma release assay, this blood test, IGRA. Um, those that have evidence of infection will benefit more, but even without, people with HIV will benefit from being offered preventive therapy. And so you're correct that um, India has a ways to go to, to reach this goal of 
six billion people by was it 2022 right now the proportion of people eligible for preventive therapy they're actually getting it mm -hmm. is very low mm -hmm. and it's for some of these reasons that I've talked about Indian providers tell me that they worry that their patients are going to have resistance so part of the problem is TB is difficult to diagnose the active disease it can be difficult and sometimes more difficult than people with HIV, but the diagnostics have improved. And so now it's, a, it's easier to rule out TB, to exclude TB from someone before you give them this preventive therapy. And you can do that with a simple, we have people cough and do a simple um, test on the sputum and make sure they don't have TB first. So. Uh, I think if th that kind of strategy is adopted more, that would be helpful. Uh, and uh, what about this uh, TPT which is given, the TB preventive uh, th treatment given, does it have to be repeated or uh, is it once for all and, uh, and what, sorry, uh, what are the side effects as of now which are being seen? In those are great questions, so I'll talk about the one about repeating mm -hmm. courses of treatment, and that is a question we do not know the answer to. So it is possible in an area with a lot of TB, high burden for TB, that when someone takes a preventive therapy, perhaps it won't last forever. We know from the study that I did, for example, of the one-month treatment, that the effect lasts for three years but more than that we don't know if it lasts for, but three years is pretty good but obviously you need it to last for longer than that and so there is a big study going on where patients are going to get the course of therapy um, uh, annually you know like more than once and to see if that's a better strategy and we should know something about that next year but right now we don't know if it's important to repeat the treatment um, after it's been given after a certain period of time. So that might t turn out. Your other question about side effects. So generally speaking, side effects of TB preventive therapy are uh, two important ones. It can cause inflammation of the liver and hepatitis, which can be quite severe, rarely, but it can happen. And so that's something you have to be uh, be mindful of. People have to be watched to make sure they don't get uh, liver inflammation. And the other one is a condition called peripheral neuropathy, which affects the nerves, mostly of the hands and feet, and starts with numbness and tingling, which can progress to a painful condition. And if it's not recognized, that can be irreversible. So those are the two most serious side effects that can happen in a small percentage of people who take these treatments. And uh, since you're talking of peripheral neuropathy and uh, diabetes also causes neuropathy, so what about this uh, uh, triple burden supposing yes. somebody on TB treatment and also having diabetes along with uh, HIV AIDS? So um, that's another really important issue that we've yet to get our arms around or really um, be able to study very well. And I was very surprised to see the um, data coming out of some of the programs in India about how many people that are getting treatment for TB also have diabetes. The proportion is very high. I think probably one of the highest in the world, I think, here in India. And so, um, that complicates everything. We don't know exactly what is the best treatment for the diabetes that would go with the TB treatment and maybe improve the outcome, you know, how to potentially prevent this. But there's a, a lot of work needs to be done to learn how to best treat people that have tuberculosis and diabetes. And then some of them, of course, will have HIV as well. So then you've got a lot of different medicines, maybe potential for drug interactions, other problems. So that's a, a challenging problem that definitely needs a lot more research. Um, any out-of-the-box approaches you would uh, uh, like to share in the context of, of course, the World's AIDS Day, which, is, uh, which will be on 1st of December? 
for the way forward to controlling aids not only controlling ending aids as well as tb by 2030 so i think one of the more interesting developments um we've had in terms of hiv treatment that has come out of the us and some other countries is use of this long acting injection therapy and so uh there've been some big studies done by the manufacturers showing that two drugs for hiv given together by injection are very effective um with injections either every month or in some cases every other month and that this is something that patients really like and so i think when this gets rolled out in the us and europe next year we will learn a bit more about how this works in real life as opposed to in a research study but i'm also working on um uh, have some funding to actually work on the development of long acting drugs for tb so say for example this one month inh and rifepentin if we could make that into an injection and then people come in and they just get the one injection and then that's it that could be um a really big game changer yes it could be it absolutely could be but there are quite a few challenges in terms of actually making that happen but that's something that is one of the sort of out of the box ideas that i would like to see get developed further your your message for the world aids day 2019 I think it's uh you know I've been doing this for a long time and compared to where we were even 10 years ago and certainly 20 years ago we've come such a long way and I'm so um uh heartened by the progress that's been made and yes we have more things to do but I think the progress that's been made with the treatments is good prevention finally we have prevention that works that's all good too so now we need uh the political will to actually make it happen and overcome some of the barriers so that the people at risk and the and uh all of the populations that really need it can take advantage of these preventive and therapeutic advances any questions yeah i think it's better you ask i won't be able to read them okay so the question which has come online is will the reasons that slowed roll out or uptake of longer ipt uh be address for faster roll out of uh, new shorter therapy please share insights so the reasons which slowed down the roll out of the longer treatment regimens or uh, the uptake of longer uh, treatment regimens for latent tb yeah. will those be addressed for yeah. i mean th- i certainly hope that sh- uh, people could hear the question or do i need to repeat it okay okay that um these shorter course therapies will be more attractive to both providers and patients. I think people will be more willing to say yes to a treatment course of only one month and commit themselves to 6 months. Particularly when they feel well, they're not they don't actually have TB and they're not even sure why they have to take this and so I think that will be easier. I think for people with hiv removing the barrier of having to test them to see if they have latent infection with skin test or another expensive blood test i think removing those will be easier and then i think the other thing that needs to happen is a better collaboration and coordination between the tb program and the hiv program so uh, right now in many parts of the world as you know these are separate and they're both working hard to take care of people but you know one's in this part of town one's in that part of town and there's not enough communication and patient has to go here or there and uh, everyone thinks that's someone else's job and so i think that would be the other thing that will really make a difference and slowly i think that 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 is happening in many places uh, now one question which comes to my mind uh, from the question which was asked just now uh, this new one month treatment regimen would it have less side effects or the yes. same or uh, yes so in our study we did show that we had less side effects than the long the longer course of treatment but uh, in a way that's almost to be expected you know it's just there's less time on the medicine less opportunity to actually develop the side effects some of them take a while to come on and so it it's sort of stands to reason that 
there would be less side effects with a shorter course, but we did actually prove that, so that was reassuring. Okay. So the next step there is just, as you said, that the cost needs to be such affordable yes. for people, Absolutely. countries to roll it yes. out. So yes. the, when the work of the scientist is over, it's yes. the work of other people that begins to ensure yes. that it reaches the people for whom it was meant. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. Friends, we were listening to Dr. S uh, Susan Swindles, oh, who is professor at the Department of Internal Medicine, University of Nebraska Medical Center, USA. And she, is, she was talking to CNS on site at the 12th National Conference of Aid Society of India in this new episode of CNS Dialogues for Sustainable Development. Stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you.